you today that we can come together in your presence and spend time together. We thank you that from what is happening here, we are able to impact lives in so many different places. And we just ask today that you would take these mes this message, you would take these words that I'm about to say, that you would speak into lives, that you would speak into situations, that you just help us to get what it is that you want us to hear today from it. And I just thank you for all the amazing things that have happened, are going to happen, and are happening right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So... You saw it, it was a pretty talented crew that I got to spend the past, uh, last week with down in the Dominican Republic. And, but on one day, I found a use for my exceptional talents. And that is, I went to the store. <laughs> and I went to the store to get some water for everybody. It, it was amazing. Uh, for some reason, we went through a lot of water every day. So I went to the store to get some water, able to use my talents. I need to work that into a mission trip somehow, and I don't know. We need one based on shopping, and I'm your girl for that one. So I went there, and I'm walking back, and I'm looking at this house. I'm looking at this construction crew that are of uh, all of us working there, and I see all the green sh shirts that are there. And all our shirts say what you are seeing up here on this screen right now. They say on the bottom line, it's what we do. And it got me thinking, because if you go to the village of San Marcos, which is where we do a lot of our work, and you were to say to them, what is it that those people do? What is, when they say it's what we do, what is it? You're going to get a lot of different answers. They're going to say, well, they've provided most of the homes here with water filters. They're the people who have come and they have built bathrooms for the school. They've built an extension on the school. We've built a home here. We've done a, a bunch of different things. If we were to ask them what it is that we do, we would, a lot of the children in that village are sponsored by people, right, sitting here right this morning. And let me just say, if you're still looking to sponsor, we still have some children, and Dottie has the board up at the back. But if you ask them in San Marcos, Dominican Republic, what is it that those people do, you're going to get an answer. And what it got me thinking was this. If I was to say to somebody on Long Island, Genesis Church, it's what we do, what would they know us for? What is it that we would be known for around here when we say, it's what we do? What should we be known for? And that's what I wanted to look at today. I wanted to look at a few things that I think we as Genesis Church should be known for. So if we say, it's what we do, they know what it is that we do around here. John 13 says this, it says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I've talked before about how repetition usually means the Bible is trying to make a point. And if ever there was a such concentrated, three words said over and over. There's three sentences here. These words are said over and over. What should we be known for? Pretty straightforward. We should be known as people who love each other. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. It says up there, the great thing with a DR, when we go away to the DR, is we're able to spend more time together. For a lot of us, I only ever see you on a Sunday morning. Usually we're rushing in, we're rushing out. We're going places, we have things to do. But in the DR, we travel together. We eat together. We work together. We pray together. We spend a lot of time with each other. And it's always amazing to see how well the team meshes together and how well everyone gets to know each other. In fact, there's usually a progression if somebody's never been a part of the team before. We, we start by being polite at the beginning of the week. And then that kind of gets to we kid around with them. And then by Thursday, I have to give the pep talk about being nice to each other because we're kind of like snipping because it's like we're like siblings by that point. He's got my hammer. No, I want it. But, and it goes like, but it's great in that atmosphere. But the problem is this. The world that we live in at the moment doesn't work that way. We live in a world that's fractured. We live in a world that seems really bitter where everybody seems to be at everyone's throats all the time. And everybody seems to be pushing their own agenda not taking time to listen, not take, taking time to care about others, belittling and arguing with everybody who may not agree with them. And 
Basically, if you don't believe me, you just need to sign on to Twitter or Facebook on any given day. And honestly, some of the stuff is horrifying that is happening on that medium. And it just shows where the world kind of is right now and what is happening. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it. If you are a person who is adding to that, it might be start time to start thinking about what you're putting on your Facebook pages. Um, I'm looking at nobody in particular, I promise. But if you are somebody who's always pushing your feelings about this administration, or the past administration, or this or that, it's time really that we need to stop doing that. It's time that we really, really need to remember by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Love. Facebook may be the best evangelistic tool that we have ever been given. It may be on any given day I come in contact with a number of people I can count on my hands, but with one post, I have access to hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Let's start using it for that matter. Let's, I'm not saying you need to be posting stuff, but love. This, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, love. Not other stuff. <laughs> Sorry. We are called to be different. We are called as followers of Christ. We are called to live in such an opposite way to how the world is living. We're called to actually commanded to live a life of lives of love. A new command I give you, love one another. It may be the hardest thing that we are called to do because our human nature does not want that. Okay, our human nature tends to go the opposite way. But basically in 1 John, he doesn't, uh, John doesn't mince words. He says this, if anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brothers or sisters, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You have to, you've got to love both. Not mean some words. If you say you love God, but you don't love your brother and sister, calls you a liar. Sorry, kind of tough for a Sunday morning, right? If you love God, you have to love your brother, you have to love your sister. There are no excuses. There are no asterisks here. There is no parentheses that says, unless you are going through a really tough time right now. It does not matter your age or theirs. It does not matter your race or theirs. It doesn't matter your gender or theirs. It does not matter your political inclinations or theirs. Okay? It does not matter. She's on a roll. What you think of gun control or what they think of gun control, we have to love each other. You have to love each other. Love has to be the way. Now, I am not saying that I have to agree with them. It does not say that I have to say whatever they are doing is correct. It does not say that I have to think, well, maybe they're right, because if I'm basing my life on here, I know what's right anyway. What it says is, no matter what, I am not called to change them. I am not called to bully them into my political ways or my thinking or whatever it is. I'm just called to love them, no matter what. No matter what happens, I'm called to love them. They may drive you absolutely crazy. There may be people in here that you see them and you just want to run the other way. And today, one of them may be the chick on the stage with the microphone. <laughs> but guess what? Sorry, you have to love me anyway, okay? We are called to love each other. I, Simplest lesson I could probably give you ever, and most of you have heard it a thousand times, but today I'm just reminding us, we're family in here. 
We're all on the same side. We all serve the same king. We are family in this place. Family sticks together. Family loves each other. That is what we are called to do. How is love going to be shown in here? How will love be evidenced? There's a very, very well-known passage in the Bible. And in fact, it's probably getting a really good airing at this time of the year because it tends to be the wedding passage. And it tells us and shows us exactly how love should be shown here. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. If we're truly a group of people, a family in here, a community who love each other, then basically this passage shows us exactly what is not going to be present in this house. Okay, what is not going to be present here is there's going to be no impatience. There's going to be no evil. All the other things, there's going to be no jealousy, no bragging, no pride, no dishonor, no anger. Those should not be evidenced here because this should be a place where we love each other. For most of us, our human default does not fall to that. But for those of us living a life in Christ, as we grow closer to him, as we grow closer to God, spend time in his word, he enables us to reach beyond ourselves and truly become new creatures and shooting and aiming for those things. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement, and he preached this to, the follow to his followers. He said this, You are to aim at nothing more than more of that love described in the 13th chapter of Corinthians. If you look for anything but more love, you are looking wide of the mark. You can go no higher than this. No higher than this. You've got to love each other. We have to find ways to love each other. 25 years in this um, country and the fact that my accent has abandoned me means that, you know, I have a lot of uh, American about me, but there's a, a few times, uh, uh, you know, of the year that I become completely British. A couple of events that bring out the Brit in me. One of those tends to be the Olympics. My husband will tell you that I become completely British for the Olympics. I'm sorry, it's something about supporting the underdog. You guys are Americans, you get, you know, a lot of medals. So I become British for the Olympics. The other thing that truly brings out the Brit back in me is a royal wedding, because I am sorry. Nobody does a royal wedding better than us Brits, okay? We do royal weddings good. So I was excited the other week that... Um, we had the royal wedding with Harry and with Meghan. We had to bring an American into it somehow. So uh, we have that royal wedding happening. And actually, of course, the star of the royal wedding was an American. And that was, of course, Bishop Michael Curry, right? Head of the Episcopal Church. He gave that incredible sermon. And here's a part of what he said. And I just wanted to read that to you today. Love is not selfish and self-centered. Love can be sacrificial, and in so doing becomes redemptive. And that way of unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive love changes lives. And it can change this world. If you don't believe me, just stop and think or imagine. Think and imagine a world where love is the way. Imagine our homes and families when love is the way. Imagine neighborhoods and communities where love is the way and commerce where love is the way. Imagine this tired old world when love is the way, unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive. When love is the way, then no child will go to bed hungry in this world ever again. When love is the way, we will let justice roll down like a mighty stream. When love is the way, the earth will be a sanctuary. When love is the way, we will lay down our swords and shields and study war no more. When love is the way, there's plenty good room for all of God's children. Because when love is the way, we actually treat each other well, like we are actually family. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all, 
and we are brothers and sisters, children of God. Imagine, imagine if this place was known as a place where we loved each other. Imagine what could be done from outside this place. Imagine how welcoming, how warm that would be. Imagine what we could achieve if we truly loved each other as families. Second point, let me say this. Let's, it's what we do. What if we were known for the fact that we genuinely care? Genuinely care. The DR teams, I um, actually sat down with a couple of passports and did a little project this week. And I worked out that this team that you just saw up here was actually the 15th team that I've taken to the Dominican Republic over the past however many years. You would truly think by now I should get a partition, participation award and be able to speak Spanish for no reason, but I've been there so many times. But, but no, my Dora Spanish still gets me um, going. But the great thing that has blessed me over the years, and every team is different, the makeup of every team is different, what we do is always different, but to see the way our folks genuinely care for the people that they come in contact with always warms my heart, always blesses me, always wants me excited to go down there. To see our people that come down with us hugging on children who are dirty, have a lot of skin conditions, a lot of things going on, picking up little children in the villages, even after I've reminded them that they don't have diapers down there, so you're playing Russian roulette with that one pretty much. So, you know, going into homes that for most of us we would never even consider, you know, most of us, God honest, our sheds are better than a lot of the houses that pe these people um, are, are there. And just to see how our folks genuinely care about those people. On Monday, the Monday morning we were there, I shared in, in our devotion time, and I said that, to be honest, us building a house or the other projects that we've done, I truly believe is our secondary reason for being down there on any um, trip that we're down there. The completion of a project, if it gets done, it gets done. That's a beautiful thing. But I truly believe that's not the reason that we're there most of the time. I truly believe that the reason we are there most of the time is to show these people that a group of people from let's be honest, the most revered nation on this earth, no matter what is going on at the moment, the nation that most people look up to, to let them know that a group of people who love God from America are willing to spend a week sweating, getting dirty, doing whatever it takes to make them more comfortable, and really showing love in action and showing them that we care. I honestly think that's the main reason we're there yeah, we built a house, but we showed Monica that no matter what life is throwing at you, no matter what is going on, we love you enough that we took a week out of our time and we came down and we spent time with you. What if we were known for the fact that we genuinely care? How do we show that we care? Let me read one of the most well-known stories in the Bible, of course, the parable that Jesus told about the good at Samaritan. Jesus said this, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. I wanted to just pull a couple of things really, really quickly from that story about how we show that we care. Number one is this, caring people aren't self-centered. The priest and the Levite were busy, important men, and... I wanted to encourage us, let's not be too busy to interrupt our plans for other people who may need help from us. Let's never be the people who are rushing by because I'm sorry, I have an appointment to get to or I have this to do or I have that to do. Let's always be the people who actually, for most of us, when we are doing, we're giving them our most valuable asset. 
For most of us, our most valuable asset is not found in our wallets, let's be honest. Our most valuable asset is our time, especially here on Long Island. So let's never be people who are too self-centered. Let's always be people who give people time as they need it. Caring people also go deeper. Let me encourage you, what if instead of when we said, how are you, as we passed somebody on a Sunday morning, we actually stopped to listen for their answer? Novel concept, I know. But imagine if we were to do that, right? Imagine if we were to take time for people. Imagine is if, as you were walking in the door on a Sunday morning, instead of praying that there's a Boston cream donut and a sesame bagel left because you really, really wanted them, you were saying, God, how about today? Could you just show me somebody who needs me to talk to them? Never going to be able to reach everybody in this room. There's a lot of people here. But what if we were to say, God, this Sunday morning, who can I talk to? Who can I support? Who can I pray with? Who can I be a shoulder to, for them to lean on this Sunday morning? We go with the extra step with caring. Caring people don't wait for somebody else to help. I'm sure the priest and the Levite weren't evil men. I'm sure they just assumed that somebody else would take care of it. Let's be caring people who always are ready to jump in, not waiting for somebody else to help. And finally, let me say this. Caring people don't pass judgment. Good Samaritan could have just said, well, what does he expect? He's traveling on this road alone. What does he think was going to happen, right? Caring people are not quick to use the phrase, if only you'd listened, or the good old, I told you so, right? Caring people don't pass judgment. Of course, our ultimate example of what caring for each other should look like comes from Jesus himself. And a couple of examples of that are shown. Here in Matthew it says, news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Over Mark it says, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus was never too tired, and he was never too busy for those who were hurting. He always cared for everyone, no matter the issue, no matter the problem. Let me just say this quickly. As word of the fact that this is a place where people care, as word of the fact that this is a place where kindness is shown, as word of the fact that this is a place where we love each other starts to go, guess what? We're going to attract people who need help. It's going to get messy. But if you look at who Jesus spent his time with, those who he ministered to, the demon-possessed, those who had really serious issues, we can't fix every single problem, but we can show them that we care and we can show people that they are loved. We can do that. Doesn't take much to say a kind word. Doesn't take much to say a smile. But sometimes we're busy rushing. And I just want to encourage you. Let's be a place where we genuinely care. For, thirdly, let me just say this. Now you know I'm actually my dad's daughter because now I'm rushing. Third, let me say this. We make a difference. What about if we were known as a place that actually makes a difference? We, after we had built Monica's house last week, um, we had what is, has become a bit of a tradition. We had a rub, uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. And then we handed Monica the key to her home and she went and she unlocked the door with tears in her eyes. We have a picture here of that. And there she is with one of her daughters um, there and she was just thrilled. She, at one point, Steve was working on the bathroom, and she just ran into the bathroom, turned on the water, and just started splashing her face. Had never been able to do that before. Had, sorry, in basic terms, a bucket in an outhouse, and would pour buckets of water on herself to wash. So running water from a tap into a sink was a completely novel concept to her, and she was just so thrilled by it all. And she actually wrote a letter um, for us all. And this is also for you, um, for you all here. She wrote it. It's been um, translated to English, so it's, it's quite formal. It says this, through this letter, we have the pleasure of greeting you and at the same time giving you our sincerest gratitude 
for your ger generous collaboration and unconditional support for us. We wish for all of those who collaborated with economic support and your gracious presence all the best and many blessings so that you may continue to realize these works of charity so important and beneficial for us who are most needy. You will be present in our prayers. There are no words to thank you for all that you have done for us in such a short time. All we can say is that may God bless you and that he be the one to repay you. I hope you have a happy and beautiful trip. God bless you again. Thank you very, very, very much. With love, Monica Eridania, who you see there, her daughter Erica, and her son Luis. They all signed the letter for that. That is to all of you. That is the letter. I am, I was, when I went to college, I was an economics major. My life, I spend a lot of th looking through financial terms. And here's the thing, you may say, well, we spent all that money, 12 people spending a week in the Dominican Republic, paying for airfares, for hotels, for all of that. We paid for all of this for four lives that we affected in that particular time. And yes, we did because those four lives matter to us, and they matter to God. Those four lives, we don't know, and I, I say this often to the teams who are down there. The work that we do down there, as you sponsor a child who's getting educated, as we go down and do different projects, we have no idea the ripple effects of what we are doing are gonna be. Some of those kids may be able, may because you have educated them, because they were in a Christian school, maybe the ones who actually grow up and turn that nation around. We have no idea, but God knows. So you know what? We are going to keep making the difference one kid at a time, one person at a time. In fact, I was doing some research this, this week, and, and here's what I worked out. Jesus' miracles, there are actually only 37 of his miracles that are listed in the Gospels. Um, John 21 talks about the fact that there, he did a lot more. In fact, if you put them in books, there wouldn't be enough room for all of them. But of those 37 miracles, 23 of those, more than half, actually involved him only changing the life of one person. Healing the blind, the deaf, the paralyzed, raising the dead to life, casting out demons. The greatest man who ever walked this earth, who had such an impact on the course of mankind, who our calendar is based upon, looked out for one person at a time. And let me say, let us be a place where we're looking out for the one person at a time, where we are making difference in lives over and over and over again. Let us be known for those who truly make a difference in those. They may be one life, but every single life matters to God. Most of the difference that we make, we truly will never know. We'll never know until we get to heaven, but that's okay, because most, most, Everything that we do should only be for an audience of one anyway. I don't do any of this for my glory. I do it for his glory up there. Let's be people who are really, truly making a difference. Let us be the church that's known for loving each other. Let's be the church that's known for caring about others. Let's be the church that's known for making a difference. And when we say it's what we do, let there be absolutely no doubt about it what we do. In the book of Acts, let me close with this. There is a story there and about these men who were not happy with what Paul and Silas and Timothy were doing. The band can come up while I'm talking. And they weren't happy with what they were doing, and they decided they were going to hunt them down, and they were going to imprison them, and they, they escaped. But they said this about them, and let me close by saying, let these, this be the words that we are known as. Let this be the words that Genesis Church is known as. And they describe Paul and Silas and Timothy with this, they said, those who have turned the world upside down. We may do it one person at a time. You may just do it by caring for each other. We may do it by the fact that this is a place where we love each other unconditionally, without thought or without thinking about it. But let us be the church that ultimately is known as the place that started to chain, turn the world upside down. Let's, let's stand.
stand and pray together this morning. And Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have brought us into your family. We thank you that you brought us into this place. And this morning, we just ask, just help us. A lot of what I said today is things that we may struggle on on our own, but we know we do everything in your strength and with your power. And we just ask today, just help us. Open our eyes to those who need us. Open our eyes to lives we can impact, ways we can be making a difference in our jobs, in our communities, in the, in the world around us. We just ask, and we just ask ultimately that this would be the play, known as the place that started to turn the world upside down. Amen.